Well, in spite of what many critics often suggest, the media is not a monolith. Different news organizations make different decisions about what is news all the time. Having said that, the past month has seen a fairly common response to certain big stories, and that raises questions about choices. How does the media decide and why? Here in Toronto, Margot Goodhand, editor of the Edmonton Journal, and Jeet Heer, freelance journalist and author whose work has been seen in a variety of periodicals, from the National Post to Slate to The New Yorker. And in Ottawa, Carleton University Associate Professor of Journalism, Ellie Alboim, and the Senior Director of Digital Media at CBC News, Marissa Nelson. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, the background. December in Sydney, Australia, at a trendy downtown coffee shop, a man with a shotgun takes hostages and has a black flag with Arabic writing placed in a window. That's enough to get worldwide attention on news channels, including the CBC's, for hours. The incident ends with the hostage taker dead in a sense his issues were personal about his past criminal record and nothing else. Only a day later, a school in northern Pakistan is grabbed by Taliban fighters. It turns into a bloodbath. 145 people are killed, 132 of them schoolchildren under 18. By every definition, this is terrorism. But most reporting compared to Sydney was less intense. Two weeks ago in Paris, stunning video dominates the world's television networks and all online platforms. Mass gunmen shouting Islamic extremist slogans brutally attack the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo for its caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad. In the end, after three days of non-stop coverage and various incidents, including at least one with an anti-Semitic focus, 17 people are left dead plus all the attackers. The very next day, Boko Haram insurgents attack Baga, a town in northern Nigeria, slaughtering at least 150, perhaps as many as 2,000. Like the Pakistan example, there is coverage, but it's nothing like Paris or Sydney. So why the differences? What makes one massacre, one attack, more newsworthy than another? What do these choices say about news coverage and those who make the decisions on what to cover and what not to? Good questions. Let's try for some answers. And there's been a lot of talk about the differences between these things. What makes one massacre more newsworthy than another? Margot. I think there's two really good reasons for it. One of them is accessibility. How easy is it for us to get video? And to, we, with Paris, we were able to watch the hostage taking live. We were able to watch the grocery store under siege. The Boko Haram stuff is coming under a, in a very volatile, very dangerous place. And I noticed your footage had nothing of the massacre in there. So, you know, one you're seeing live, the next you're, you're hearing trickling out reports days later. It makes for a very different, much more compelling narrative. So that's one. The second reason is the underlying assumption always that we really kind of judge the merits of news as to how relevant they are to our audiences. And so oftentimes when you see something like the Charlie Hebdo, it's how does this affect me? Does, could this come here? Could this, uh, could this be me? Could this? And so there's a certain amount of um, filtering going through there where the shock and the uh, anger about the uh, shootings there really resonated here. We just had the Parliament Hill thing, so it, it happened. Jean, what about you? How do you see it? I, everything Margot said is uh, accurate. I, I think there's an, another underlying factor, which it's a bit rude to mention, but um, the media in North America is like ridiculously white. Uh, it's, it's whiter than snow. It's whiter than cocaine. Uh, and that creates a certain set of biases or assumptions as to what's relevant. And a place like Sydney and Paris, a lot of journalists can relate to that and they think their audiences can relate to that. And I think that's actually in some ways a false assumption. The assumption that, like, you know, Sydney and Paris can, are more relatable than a place like Nigeria. Um, my, uh, I have two sister-in-laws who were born in Sri Lanka but grew up in Nigeria. And for them, Nigeria is not a fantasy land. It's not a magic land. It's, it's something that's very real. And they actually grew up in some of the areas uh, where some of this terrorism is happening. And we're kind of failing that audience. 
I want to show you a couple of quotes before I bring Ellie and uh, Marissa in here. And here, here's the first one, because it kind of relates. It, it was a Time Online piece uh, just this week. Paul Slovic from the University of Oregon, professor of psychology. The psychological distance between us and France is smaller than the psychological difference between us and Nigeria. There's a sense of personal vulnerability in the Paris attack that I don't think one gets from the Boko Haram attacks. Ellie, what does that say about us, if that is the kind of theory we're using on these? Well, I'm not saying I disagree with the theory. I think that there are a couple of unfortunate impulses. Um, one is, uh, the more like us, the more interesting it is. Um, uh, the other issue that I guess I'd raise is journalism is generally about threat assessment. Uh, people ask, you know, am I safe? Is my home safe? Is my city safe? Is my country safe? Is my world safe? Probably in that order. And the more threatening uh, something is, as Margot said, uh, to reach our shores, uh, the more worried we are about it. And then lastly, and maybe unpleasantly uh, somewhat, is that um, there, we hear a lot about ethnic violence in various parts of the world. A lot of it seems to happen quite frequently. It's almost predictable. And because of that, it begins to lose some of its news value, uh, where when it happens closer to home to people like us and is rarer, then we tend to find it more newsworthy. It doesn't, say, it doesn't say all that much positive about us, but it goes no. into the decision making. Marissa, I'm going to throw a different quote at you, and, and, and you tell me what you, what you think of this and what it says about us. Uh, this one comes from Marco Iacoboni at UCLA, he's a psychiatry professor. I think in this case, cultural anthropological differences can play a big role in how much we empathize with others. I jokingly call this the dark side of empathy. What do you make of that? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's I think it's interesting. Uh, Margot mentioned the idea of relevance to the audience, and proximity is one of those uh, pieces of, that makes something incredibly uh, incredibly relevant. I think one of the difficulties you were talking about the Boko Haram massacre in Baga. I mean, the the there was no footage. You can't see the children and the mothers and the fathers. So it is it's even harder for us to kind of create that empathy. I'm going to show you uh, a tracking of Twitter. Um, on, on these two stories, these last two stories, uh, because this suggests, well, let me read it first of all. The, the number of tweets on uh, the Charlie Hebdo, well over four million. On Boko Haram, under a million. This gives some sense, at least on Twitter, of what people are talking about, what they're thinking about. And one wonders whether those kind of stats drive our decision making in terms of letting the audience push us in the direction of the kind of story they want to see. And that, that's been kind of what we've been talking about here. Margo? Yeah, we've talked about Twitter before, and I, th I think there is a sense where you see this tsunami of, you know, commentary coming and everyone reacting, and you feel that you need to be aware of, of what's happening and, and react to that as well. I, you know, I, but I got that from our readers, too. There, that there were, there, I have one woman phoning me up saying, why aren't you running these cartoons? The blood of these people is on your hands. And so there, is a, there was a very emotional, very visceral reaction, not just in the Twitter sphere, it, to this story. It had legs. Is it okay to say the audience drives the story, decision making? Well, I think media always has two responsibilities. One is to gain an audience, but it's also to educate an audience, especially for something like the CBC, which actually has, as part of its mandate, a civic mission. Uh, but I'm not even sure like what you're saying quite proves it, because uh, there's four times as much Twitter for uh, Charlie Hebdo as uh, Nigeria, but I think in the media, you're not getting four times as much coverage of Charlie Hebdo. You're getting like maybe 10 times or 20 times as much. There's actually, I mean, I actually use Twitter a lot and uh, blogs a lot to get news from Africa, because they cover it much better than uh, the mainstream media does. Uh, there's like a wonderful blog called Africa is not a country and many other sites where you get Nigerian voices. And there are many Nigerian voices on Twitter, much more so than in the mainstream media. Marissa, you're the social media expert. Has, uh, has social media changed the game and the way we tell our stories and the decisions we make? 
Well, there, there's a couple of parts to that question. I would say it's changed our coverage because we can get photos from places that we aren't. And that's one of the big um, the big problems in, in terms of covering the Baga massacre because there's so little uh, internet access, we can't even get photos from people who were there. So in that way, we're able to cover things in ways that we never could before. We do watch social media for trends, but I think it's more changed how we cover things. It's interesting, when, you, when I actually looked at the coverage of uh, the Boko Haram Baga massacre, when I looked at where our audience came from, the vast majority of our audience for that coverage actually came from social media. It didn't come from our home pages or our world pages. So people on social media were really engaged with this story. So the question I guess I would say is maybe we should have looked at that and said, well, what's the social media strategy to get more of our audience engaged in this important story in Africa that perhaps the mainstream isn't paying attention to? What do you make of that, Ellie? Uh, I guess I'm a little more dubious. I, I, I think social media has had two uh, kind of negative, in my view, um, consequences. One is it's, it's become the new instant poll, and a lot of journalists uh, look at it as, as, as a way to validate their news choices. Um, because after all, journalism is a consumer-driven business. They're, it's businesses. Most uh, of the companies uh, develop niches, and uh, they tilt towards more uh, uh, pandering to audience desires than they are towards uh, following an independent agenda. And Twitter seems to give them, uh, Twitter or other social media, seems to give them a validation of doing that or a way to connect their audiences. Can and second of, all, oh, uh, second of all, if I could just make one more point, yeah. Uh, the social media also gives cover to journalists to make arbitrary choices. A lot of newsrooms say, I don't have to worry about this story because people have another way of getting at it. Uh, they can get on social media and they can get details. And so it's not my responsibility necessarily to provide that because I've got to provide things they find more relevant. And in doing so, I think they abdicate their role at uh, explaining what's truly important. Margo? I want to talk about the good side of Twitter just for, just to, for, <laughs> Jeet <laughs> yes. and I could both do yeah. this. But it's so important to me because the mainstream media wasn't in Ferguson. Yes. Uh, and I started watching Ferguson on my phone and mm. went, holy smokes, there's something going on there. We didn't, you know, there was, AP wasn't there. The Washington Post had a correspondent there. The photos that were coming out, the, mm. the you know, you knew it was like an Arab Spring, but you knew that this, there was news there and it wasn't being covered. And really, that that pushed a lot of people to to see what was happening there. So there are lots of times where it is, uh, the, you know, Twitter is our eyes and ears on the people, right? It's it people also, journalism. Yeah, it, also calls us, it also calls us to account, right? What about the 200 school children that were uh, kidnapped by Boko Haram? That wasn't really a story that mainstream media was covering until social media actually picked it up. So in some ways, I actually think that social media can hold us to account and say, hey, why aren't you covering this important story? And part of this, this whole discussion uh, about how the choices are made on on these, uh, li especially these last two stories, has been engineered coming out of uh, social media and the repeating on social media of things like Rex's point of view last week has had like uh, 300,000 views on, on on our Facebook page, which is sort of unheard of. So uh, you know, it's an interesting debate and an interesting discussion, uh, and we want to have more of it. Because but first we've got to take a quick break. When we come back, this question. Is terror the biggest story of our time? And if so, should it be? All right, welcome back to tonight's Media Watch. Joining us in Toronto, Margot Goodhand and Jeet here, and from Ottawa, Ellie Alboim and Marissa Nelson. The question was about terror. Is it the number one story uh, that we are dealing with today? And if so, should it be? Ellie? No, it's a story, but it's far from the number one story. There are lots of more, many more important stories. You know, uh, poverty, the incidence of uh, disease, preventable disease. More people are killed in traffic accidents and from preventable disease than are being killed by terrorist acts. Uh, the only, uh, you know, overwhelming importance of terrorism, if it actually does blossom into the kind of clash of civilizations or culture war that the terrorists want it to be, but there's no sign of that taking, uh, taking hold. I think it's overemphasized because of the personal fear of security that people have that it may touch them. But in terms of its importance against other things, no, I don't believe it is. Margo? 
Oh, Ellie, I, I, I disagree with you. I wish I, I wish I, I wish I believed that. Um, but I honestly think that since 2001, that you, 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 we have had a, we declared war on terror. That there have been repercussions since then. We've dealt with 15 years, almost 15 years of the actions that we have taken, creating what we, what, what's happening. It, it, it seems to be escalating. Um, I can't help but feel that we have to start looking at this, uh, educating ourselves better, uh, questioning some of our cultural assumptions, dealing with the war in, 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 actually maybe even changing the lexicon. Maybe we have to start calling it a war, but that would be my impression. Jude? Well, I think all the stuff Margot talks about is this, uh, the, uh, the terrorism is the pretext for those things. It's the pretext for these wars. But I don't actually think it's necessarily the cause of those things. And it's absolutely right that terrorism, I mean, if you're Canadian, you're much more likely to be killed by your husband than you are by a terrorist. Far more likely. You know, but we don't have like, you know, like the husband threat. Uh, maybe we should. Marissa. I'm actually going to agree with Ellie here. I, it's a, a story, but not the story. We were saying something similar about the environment after the tsunami and Katrina. It's an important story, but it's not the story. All right, listen, good discussion. Uh, and I think we could easily go on, and I'm sure we will uh, at a later date. Thank you all, Ellie and uh, Marissa in Ottawa tonight, Margot and Jeet here in Toronto.